Uh, greetings, greetings, everyone. Welcome back to another special episode of the Death Taxes and Sports Podcast, Road to Episode 93. We are officially, officially at Episode 93. We are joined by Ben Holloway. Uh, our friend Gary Johnson will be waking up from his nap shortly. I don't know when. He probably has to get his bottle from the from the whatever. And we also have a very special guest. We have Mr. Nick Wilcox, co-host of TBQ Sports Big Time, sports fan and a fantasy football fanatic. Sounds like we have to get him in the fantasy football league. Gentlemen, how are y'all doing today? Nick, how, how are we feeling today, bud? Oh, we're feeling fantastic. Ready to rock and roll. Ready to have an awesome show. I thank you guys so much for allowing me to be here. I can't wait to hear you guys' opinions. I can't wait to have a an awesome sports show tonight. Right, we we uh, like that. We like that vibe. We like that energy. Good stuff. No doubt. And all of a sudden, um, Ben is a LeBron James fan. All of a sudden, if you see the jersey in the back, I don't know where that came from. All of a sudden, but I had to poke fun. Um, where is your? What is your motivation? Inspiration, Ben. Ben Benjamin. <laughs> Damn, ben, Benjamin, Motiva- motivation for what, sir? I don't, I don't know, sir. General? Whoa, hey, hey, hey! Why are you calling me, sir? I'm just calling you by what your parents gave you, Benjamin. I just gotta give him a hard time, man. We like to have a little bit of banter here. We just like to have a little banter, but it's all good. But any, someone's like, oh, Ben, why is that? Is that Ben? Why is that? Is that the why they why they did it? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. I'm not, I'm not but, quite sure, but let's get it rolling. Let's yeah, get let's get this topics. going. So yeah, let's, go. let's get going. Ben, it's my job to talk about what we're going to introduce the topics. Here. Thank you. Um, respectfully. Um, Nick, it's okay. We we both ate our dinners. We're all good. So tonight, we're going to be discussing <laughs> the NBA draft. Damian Lillard show, Otani. I'm looking forward to that one. Chris Paul, and as well as predicting all 14 playoff teams in the NFL. But Nick, I first have to ask you, who is your basketball team? I don't have one. I've been – so back in the day, I was a big into the Pistons and the Spurs. Um, Spurs, okay. I, Spurs, I just love the way that that dynasty really played out, that franchise in general. Um, the Pistons, because, you know, I had a Ben Hamilton jersey. Um, oh, sorry, nice. Sorry, Rich Hamilton jersey um, and a Chauncey Billups jersey. Um, I just loved – both those teams back in the day just loved how I like to play basketball. Really grind it out, play great defense, get good stops, score baskets. Baskets, um, but I don't have a team now because there's every two or three years stars are moving teams. The NBA is such a centric, you know, player centric, like league now. So that's just kind of like where I'm at now. Yeah, and uh, Ben, you know, and and I totally respect that. I think that the way that we have, we're gonna talk about Damon Lillard as well. But before we get to this NBA draft, Ben, you know, I was thinking, you know. Just, I want to touch on this whole just Joel and B thing, just real quick, if we can, just for like two seconds. Do you think that he's going to get restless if they have another postseason exit the way that they did? And then, Nick, I want to get your thoughts. I just want to pivot just real quick because I was thinking about this on the way to getting my chicken biscuit sandwich from Chick fil A. So, the answer to that is for me, how, is he like Dame? Or does he is, is he going to get restless? Can you see him that, forcing that's, himself that's, out? That's what I'm saying. Is he going to be like Dame and want to stay with one team, or does he want to win? That's the answer, really. Because yeah. I mean, I don't know. Try to sorry to make it simple, but that's really what it is to me. Does he get impatient and want to go somewhere where he thinks he can win, or does it matter to him to be loyal? Right, right. Facts, facts. Just curious, Nick. Your your thoughts. My thoughts on just. Damian, I'm sorry, on Damian Lillard or more? No, 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 on on, on Joel Embiid because when I was – Oh, that Joel Embiid. The sandwich oh. was dope, by the way. It was awesome. Thanks for asking. But, uh, yeah, just your okay. thought. <laughs> I honestly, like – I think, honestly, Philly, they've been just a bonkers franchise the last couple of years. Um, you know, they still haven't gotten rid of Tobias Harris for whatever reason. Um, they need to bring back James Harden to have any legitimacy to have an Eastern Conference run again. But even then, are they going to get back to semifinals? Um, this team should have actually beat Boston. And the fact that they didn't, the fact that they crumbled in Game 7, um, just goes to show they, how far... Game 6 as well. Uh, sorry, yeah. They choked, they, they choked the fourth quarter lead at home. Tatum, Tatum wooed, them, wooed them up to victory. 
I'll just yeah. say that. I don't want to say this game. Game six was a debacle in itself, but game seven was worlds, worlds weirder. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. so I mean, that's where, again, like this Philly team in general, like you got to look at it as, yeah, they got Nick Nurse now as the head coach. I think Joel Embiid still has a lot to prove, even though he just won the MVP, which should have been Jokic's, in my opinion. Thanks. But, Thanks. but this is where we're at. I don't think – I think Joel Embiid just has to – like. I think any Eastern Conference team, just for the sake of conversation, you're gonna have an opportunity to get to the NBA Finals. If you go to, if you're in the West, you're gonna go through a gauntlet, no matter what. In the Eastern Conference, you're gonna have your opportunity to beat teams that you know, whatever have you. Look at Miami this past year; they just beat the Bucks. They beat this, they beat these these other teams to get to the finals. The Knicks, the Celtics, to get to the finals. So it's like it's not like you're going through as such a gauntlet edge versus the West. So in my opinion, I think Joel Embiid just needs to stay. He needs to still prove it. Um, but in order to do that, yeah, he needs some help. Um, and I think James Harden, him being back on the team would make some sense. But I think in general, this team needs to just have another guy that needs to be able to step up. Tobias Harris is supposed to be that guy who's getting paid to do so. And the fact that he isn't, you just need to get rid of him. You need to get, get him out of there. And if Harden's not coming back, go get Fred Van Fleet. Go grab, you know, a Jordan Clarkson potentially. You know, just get this team moving when it comes to shooting and, you know, guarding, whatever have you. So I think that's yeah, no, a doubt. no doubt, no doubt. And I was just kind of curious because I just really just wanted to get some thoughts. It was just kind of on on my mind there. But Philly's not going to win a championship in the next five years. I'll put I'll put a whole do- one dollar and uh, seventy three cents on that. I will bet. I will totally bet. I will totally bet one cent. Why so specific with the cents? One dollar and seventy three cents. <laughs> I mean because. Yeah, he started that. He started that about two months ago, where he's just offering <laughs> bets for a dollar and three cents, a dollar and fifty yes. cents. He, oh, once yes. he's doing it, he's got to keep it going. Now, yes, of I mean, course, that's like my thing. Rolling. I'll go that's check my piggy bank. All right, sounds good. A dollar eighty-four. That's it. I got no more. For okay, whoa, 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 whoa! Now you're getting too rich for my blood. You, you know, both <laughs> you guys, New England, did so I gotta sound like a Boston guy, right? So I can fit in. Oh hey, okay. boy, I'm kidding. Okay. Oh, anyway, let's get back that to some pom poms, ready, folks. Let's get to this. Let's get to this. Let's let's get to this NBA draft and and, and Ryan we are going to get to some we're going to get to some baseball we're going to get to NBA we're going to get to all this stuff but let's first start with this NBA draft I first got to say the Denver Nuggets I'm going to go to the Denver and then uh, Nick I'll pass it to you then Ben I'll let you have it I I really got to say I'm really impressed with with what the Denver Nuggets here you look at the players all of them are under the age of 28 right outside of KCP right you look at Aaron Gordon he's going to be 25 you look at uh Michael Porter Jr., he's 24. Aaron Gordon, or no, um, the other two dudes, names are drawn blanks, but Joker's going to be 28. I mean, they have a real good window to be able to extend this championship run, and I really like what they did, and I have to give them a B-plus on this grade because they've really got one of my favorite players via the Pacers. Is um, I'm probably going to pronounce his last name wrong, but whatever. Juan Strether, whatever his name is, but I liked him in Gonzaga. I think he was a very good pick. And then uh, Jalen Pickett, a guard from uh, Penn State. The one thing about Strather, I'm pronouncing his name wrong. I don't care. The guy is six foot seven and is a wingman and can shoot. I think that man's going to add a lot of. He's he's just a dude that's just going to be able to play right away and it's going to be able to contribute right away. This team is going to go from eight deep to probably maybe nine or ten now, and they're going to easily be able to replace Joe um, Jeff Green. Gentlemen, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the Nuggets are set up well for the future with the young talent that they have on their roster. Jokic, Aaron Gordon, 28 and 27. Jamal Murray, 26. And Porter, 24. That rookie, who next year will be a second, uh, Christian Brown, 22. So they got young talent, and all that talent is locked up for at least two more years, maybe even more than that. Uh, And they did well in the draft, like you said. Um, It was actually a little bit... I know I'm going off from the Nuggets, but it was a little bit surprising that when we were looking at, you know, doing a little bit of research as far as, like, who had the best drafts, and it was, like, unanimous. Like, everywhere, the top three was Spurs, Rockets, Blazers. Easily. Every, everywhere that I looked. And, and the Spurs, like, uh, for me, yes, of course, they got Wembyama, Victor Wembayana. There you go. I said that wrong. Um, I can say it right <laughs> off air, but not on air. <laughs> but but their other their other pick is also 
uh, French as well, City Casico. And, you know, scouting report is a really, really good defender and, you know, good playmaker as well. Um, as far as the Rockets go, we know they're top pick. I mean, I'm in Thompson, but they got somebody, Cam Whitmore, who's supposed to be a top five pick and got him at number 20. So that's good there. Sorry, I'm going on a tangent here. But the other thing I uh, read about the Rockets is they there's a pretty good consensus that they also drafted the two best athletes in the entire draft, although Victor is kind of number one there, so I don't know how they got to that. But anyways, the two picks that they got were really athletic. And then the Blazers really quick, Scoot Henderson, a lot of years would be the number one overall pick. So – I know you asked, about about Chris Murray. You, you asked about the Nuggets, and I went a whole nother way. But no, anyway. it's all good. No, actually, at Houston and Portland, but but got to give a shout-out to that guy, Chris Murray, the forward from Iowa. He's also a nice pickup for, for the Blazers as well. Yep, I, I gave wrote, him a grade. Yep, yep. Yeah. yep. But, but, Nick, your thoughts? So, um, I'm sorry, what was the question in general? About uh, yeah, this you know, I probably didn't even general, say or is it more? I probably should have asked what the question was. My bad. It's okay. I got too excited. Oh, oh, so, it's all good. It's all good. It no. came from a great place. <laughs> <laughs> so teams so teams that you feel had great drafts or really solid picks. Okay. Like setting themselves up for the future. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, Portland was obviously one. I'll continue with that. I think when you ha- – and then, you know, I think Portland is set up to really, like, have an opportunity to have at least Dame in the conversation of the playoffs, but nothing more. Um, but Scoot Henderson, though, regardless what happens with Dame Lillard, they're setting up for their future. And then getting him at three when people thought, you know, he was going to Charlotte. I mean, sh- by the way, a loser is Shams because he was saying, like, <laughs> Scoot Henderson is going to go number two. And then all of a sudden he doesn't go number two. So I think, in general, I think Portland was a solid, solid team. I honestly thought, you know, be cra- be, mind you, the Warriors, I think, definitely won this one as well. Um, on the low, because how do you get a guy like Traylon Jackson Davis very late in the draft when he was like literally showing out constantly in college? Like this draft, in a sense, baffled me a bit because there were guys that were dominating in college, literally going second round. Some of them didn't get drafted. Some of them are two way players, like Sonogo. Like not yeah. not being a homer. I'm not being a homer. This guy was it just in the whole just one whole thing. And you're not trying to move someone like that. Um, I think in general with NBA versus the NFL draft, in general, NBA players are just going to be selected based on intangibles more than there was more production. Um, I think the strategy has shifted for the NBA draft with some of these GMs over the last couple of years because they're just looking for guys to kind of piece more of their roster together. A winner, I would say, is the, the whole G League night. You got, you got like what, what, five of these top players, six players yeah. that were top, drafted at the top of the draft, the Thompson twins, um, the top, um, who else? Um, obviously, School Henderson. You know, you got guys that were overseas. Like, you, I don't think we had a college player get drafted in the top ten until, like, what, eight or nine or something like that? It was crazy. Yeah. Um, well, Brandon Miller, obviously. But in general, I think there was – I think there are more ways now to get more seen in the NBA than ever before. Um, so I think that is a win in its entirety. But as far as going back to the teams, I think the Warriors, I think, are be, – besides the CP3 acquisition, we'll get into that. But I think they're a solid get because I think Jackson Davis is literally a guy that I would want on my team to mold because the guy is a in-the-paint scorer. Once he gets his shot more there, I tell you, I think he'll, he'll put it together. He'll be one of those guys that we look back in the draft and you're like, oh, man. How did we miss out on this? Like, well, did you watch the damn tape? Yeah. <laughs> did you watch his games this past season? <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, yeah. But, but like I said before, I think it's the NBA scouts. That's why I'm a little surprised that some of these picks, um, that some of these guys are being drafted based on more intangibles than they were about production and performance. And that's just where that goes. Um, Ryan says the G League is a huge, huge place to show off, and it's true. I mean, it's not the only game. Like college, not the only game in town anymore. Ever since now, because of all these NIL deals, like you know, that's one thing to keep kids in college. But honestly, like 
there have been players since high school been chomping at the bit and they know they're better and they don't want to go to college and this is a way to showcase their skills so absolutely i think it's a like this is the first year i feel like in a draft that the g league actually like has showcased like they're like okay they're prospects and it's like oh okay this is what they've been cooking up the last couple years so um i think more players in general here got the nod teams I mean, Wizards are not exactly a winner, but I love what they're doing at the moment. They're just tearing it down. And with all these younger pieces, this younger core, um, I think in general, that's another winner. Um, heard that says the draft was decent. If you weren't a big man, Drew Timmy, the center from Kansas, can't recall his name, just to name a few not drafted. It's true. It, 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 it was that. Yeah, it was like, hey, well, like, you know, what well, are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and Nick, I think that you make, and, and, and shout out to Marissa. She's one of our co-hosts. Hopefully she's uh, her voice is feeling better. But, uh, you know, I, I think that that's what it shows, right? Um, homeboy from, from, from Connecticut, right? Any any other draft five, six years ago, Ben, he oh, would have Jordan, been Jordan Hawkins. Ever. Jordan yeah. Hawkins? Him or um, – Oh, you're saying like Jordan, Jordan the Hawkins. Center, the center. Oh. I'm talking about something. the centers. He was a straight or, beast. Or whatever he was a yeah. he was a beast in the post. You could not stop him. Mm-hmm. He has a home in the NBA, but it's probably going to be a role player because he has no type of perimeter game whatsoever. And you're probably thinking he's very undersized. He's six foot seven, and so against little boys and in, in college, he's going to dominate. But it's only going to be a matter of can he develop his game to be more of a you know perimeter type of player. I mean, the guy was a straight beast. But just real quick to touch on the Houston Rockets, the Houston Rockets are going to be able to have a young talented lineup of um, of a mean of a mean Thompson, right? You're going to have Cam Whitmore, you're going to have Jalen Green, and you're going to have Jabari Smith. All those guys are at least six five or more. And Udoka, who's coming in with that type of young talent, they're going to be something to watch for in the next. I'm thinking next two to three years. But Gary Johnson, how you doing? You're mute. Uh, on mute. No, there you go. I, I, no, I knew I was on mute. I was also like pulling up your agenda as well. I apologize. It's um, all good. Children, that's my response. No doubt, no doubt. But no, let's get you in this, man. This uh, this draft, Gary the Legend Johnson, sir. Let's let's pass the baton to you. A team that had a good draft, really solid pick. What was one of your fans? We we were just we were dying to know what you thought. I wasn't, in, I wasn't as thrilled about this draft as I have been in years past. I don't know why. Like, you had, like, once you got past one and two, once you got past Women Yama and um, uh, Brandon Miller, it was like, and everybody else is a maybe, they should be good, they will be, like, they, they can reach that next level, but there wasn't anybody that I'm like, that really yeah, like that, that blew my mind. I'm sorry, like, just there wasn't anybody for me. That's terrible. That's terrible. Why? Well, who, who'd you have in mind? Like, I you don't think you don't you don't think Scoot Henderson is is decent? I think he's good. I, I I'm not. Don't get me wrong. I think that there's a lot of there really was wasn't there really weren't that many generational talents. Here's what I wanted to say. You have a lot of, of solid ball players. You like Scoot Henderson. He's going to have a solid 15 year career in the NBA. That's probably going to lead. That may lead to the Hall of Fame one day. May not. But like, there's a lot of those. Like, there wasn't that like seismic shift. Like besides Victor, besides him, there wasn't a solid like. Oh my God! The whole franchise changes now with Victor. You know the Spurs are going to be back in playoffs next season as long as he stays healthy. Beyond and, that, everybody else is like, okay, they're good. Let's see how far we can get with them. And, and here's what I'm, and, and I'm going to say, Ben, and then Nick, I want to get your thoughts on this. Like, sure. this draft, I really think this draft was one of the more underrated, one of the more underappreciated drafts, right? You look at guys like Cam Whitmore. You look at the Thompson Twins. Scoot Henderson is going to be an, is going to be an all-NBA franchise-changing type talent. I'm just that convinced. I'm not convinced about Wimbayama just because we haven't seen a guy that tall be able to sustain um, just his availability. I'm just not convinced that he's going to be this mega star. And it's not because of lack of ability, but it's just because if he's so frail. But you got these guys that are really good. Grady Dick, who's going to be a great three-point shooter from Kansas, but he wore an ugly 
draft day outfit. I don't know what the heck that thing was. It was like um, uh, trying to be the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> The yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ben, take it away though, and then uh, the Nick, and then we'll go back to you, Gary. But that thing—I don't know if he was trying to audition for like a middle school tap dance show. I don't know. <laughs> oh god! So we're talking about the good. Uh, there's always bad as well. Yes. Uh, go for it. Three teams for me, bad, and then we'll obviously we'll toss it around. Um, the Bulls, number one. A lot of people think Julian Phillips was their only pick was a reach and they traded and they traded second round picks to get him. So for me, even though they only had one pick, that's, that's a downgrade there. The Grizzlies, they drafted probably going to get his name wrong, but Tariq Biberovic, there you uh, go. which he probably won't be in the NBA for another two years. From what I was reading, he's still going to play in Europe. So for a team that is a true contender, which they are, Jaw's not gone forever. Different subject for another day. But Grizzlies are still a contender. For them to draft someone who can't help, and then their other pick, what I was reading, which uh, of course I can't find, have the name right now, but their other pick was supposedly someone who wasn't even supposed to get drafted. So Memphis, and then the Magic. The reason is their second pick, Number 11, Jet Howard, although he is probably going to be pretty good, um, most people thought he was going to go in the 20s, and he went at number 11. So those are my three on the downside. Nick, what you got? Who had, who had bad drafts? I would say I think Derek Lively is a little bit of a reach. I mean, there were just compens like comp different comps from all over the place for him to go 12 versus some other guys on this list. I just felt the Mavericks were kind of trying to fill their need, but I feel like they could have got someone else a little bit later. Um, I think on that pick, I could, they could have easily got another guard. I, I thought that like, you can from Michigan could have been a guy that could have easily gotten Hawkins could have been a guy. Um, just another person you could get instant offense from. Um, in general, I thought it would be more of a better fit for them. So I thought they kind of flailed there. Um, another selection I had was, I'm not sure about Clowney um, from Bama. I've seen some good things from him, but I'm not exactly sold on him being a first-round pick. He was kind of more teetering towards like that first, second round for me. Um, but other than that, I mean, those were some, yeah, I wasn't like, Please with those picks. I mean, they could have done a lot worse, but that's where I kind of was. Um, I didn't mention, but I think Denver really killed the draft too. Like yeah. the players I really liked, they end up falling to them. Like a Jaden Pickett, who at Penn State was like instant offense type of guy. Um, and um, who they grab at twenty nine? Um, uh, Strawford from Gonzaga. Now that's Gonzaga so. wasn't like a Gonzaga like. They were a team that just – they ran through Drew Timmy, but they always had decent guys like Strawford that would be able to come in there and do some things. But I really like what he can do for Denver. It kind of reminds me of a – not as potent MPJ, but something along those lines that they can mold. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. It's, it's going to be – definitely going to be very interesting to see how kind of all these guys are going to be developed. But, Gary, your thoughts? Um, so, for me – my, it, I start off with the Clippers. Um, I personally think the kid they got the last pick in the first round. Um, what's his name? I'm looking at that, Kobe Brown. Uh, he's good, but I really feel like that's somebody that you could have easily picked up in the second round. I think he had the first round was a bit of a reach for him. I think that was a stretch. Although they did get Jordan Miller, which I thought was appropriate for a second round pick. Um, I wasn't in love, like I said, with Ben said, I wasn't in love with what the Cavs did. Um, I like Imani Bates. Um, I think that's a good flyer for them as far as the second round goes. Definitely. Um, but, you know, they, I just feel like we're, we're, the question is who had a badge of who could have done more. I feel like they <coughs> shut gold elsewhere. I think Bates was not to be a solid player for them or definitely <coughs> – um, one of the steals of the draft when it comes down to it later on down the line. Um, 
I had no idea who the hell Boston picked. I had to look him up. Uh, Jordan Walsh. He's physical or whatever, but he's also a 6'8 forward who is going to uh, be buried on a bench behind a bunch of 6'7 to 6'9 forwards. Like, that's kind of Boston's uh, MO and as far as, like, it, it, as far as in their in their front court. So we'll see what happens with him. And then um, then you hit the nail on the head with Memphis, you know, with the kid Viverovich and Gigi Jackson. They're good, but are they going to be impact players, especially when you're going to be missing your star player for the first 25 games? So, you know, I'm looking at those three teams, specifically the Clippers. I'm looking at them going like, okay, your picks weren't terrible, but – how much of an impact are they going to have? I mean, facts. I mean, those are all, I mean, those are all facts. Love that Guys, I just I got to throw one more team out here. I really think the Wizards dropped the ball on this one. Um, Belil Kolobale. Col- Col- um, I just thought it was a reach at number seven, and I felt like all the other players that were on the board um, – you know, if you're the Wizards and you did the salary dump, right? And you, you, you know, you got Tyus Jones, you got dude who's who can't even who couldn't hit a three point shot from Golden State all of a sudden, uh, and you know, you really could have had a good opportunity to get a really good player that could be a starter for you and that could really grow into the young core that you're trying to assemble. And if I'm a Wizards fan, I am not necessarily sure if I feel that this is a guy, mind you, he was on Wimbayama's team. I'm just not sure if he's if he was even top twenty. It was a very big. They could have gotten Grady Dick. They could have gotten Whitmore. They could have gotten some really really good young guys that really could contribute and grow into a starter. So that one was just a little bit disappointing. But anyway, let's get to this. Um, let's get right back to this Damian Lillard one because this one's going to be interesting. When they drafted uh, and they got tossed to do when they when they when they drafted Scoot Henderson. Every we always do the questions. We're all going to start about you know. Are they going to trade him? Are they going to keep him? They say that he wants to stay. Um, but I just don't see them being able to build a team around him that is going to be able to contend within the next year. Your thoughts, and then Ben. Okay, so... Jamie Lillard. Oh, boy, I got to lead this off. I love it. Um, what should they you know, do? So- do you give him a favor and trade him to a contender I, if he doesn't wish it, or or no, keep him. I honestly think that Damian Lillard deserves better. He's been with this team, this city for quite some time, and it feels like they don't do the necessary things to get him help. Um, you did some things when it came to you know Jeremy and Grant coming to town, um, you know doing some things because he's versatile. Um, but Nurkic can't Nurkic can't stay healthy. CJ McCollum had left town, but would you really, you know, I, Simons was a guy that I really like. Um, but this team in general just needs more, and it just seems like every time they get a few pieces, a few pieces go. Um, so it's and it, again, you're when you're in the West, you got to do a lot more things to get yourself over the hump. And Portland's just not doing it, and I don't think they are in position in the next two years, three years team and sniff a conference final, let alone an NBA final. Um, so they need to do the right thing. They need to trade Damian Lillard. They need to trade him. He needs to get traded to a solid team that could go compete for a championship because although the only reason why that hasn't happened yet is because Damian Lillard is a cool cat. He's a very chill dude. And it's not like he's one of these prima donnas that comes out and he says he's going to demand you trade him because of X, Y, and Z. I think Damian Lillard is just cool with going with the flow right now still until like you know really reach a boiling point um but either whether they whether the franchise wants to trade him or whether damian wants to go neither one of these guys whether it comes to organization or damian alert neither of them want to have a, the pr hit they're just playing a game of chicken in my opinion it's like the organization doesn't want to trade damian Lillard because then it lose interest from the fans and this this then the third because they're losing that guy's gonna sell tickets they're gonna get his jersey and then Damian Lillard doesn't want to feel like he's betraying the city of Portland because if he asked for a trade, he wants to be out. He wants to win a championship. I mean, no one would probably knock him, but be still like, a, man, why'd you leave? You said you were going to bring a championship to Portland. Um, in my opinion, there's two teams I feel that Damian Lillard will have an opportunity 
to have it win a championship um, and have a solid nucleus core to have at least a couple of shots at getting the championship. The first team is the obvious one, Miami. Um, Miami, the only problem with them right now, and, and also just in general, the whole Damian Lillard thing, there's only so many destinations he can go to right now because there's only some teams that are still young, still building that core together. And then there's more of these other teams that have some really good cores and good teams, but they have no cap space. So it's a weird conundrum because, you know, obviously that if that were the route that the, that the organization was going to trade Damian Lillard to, that'd be like, all right, like, where are we going to trade him to, though? Miami is obviously – Miami would probably put together a package of, like, Tyler Hero, maybe Kyle Lowry, and some draft picks, um, potentially. That's a potential package. Um they couldn't trade Dame and Butler. I don't think Damian Lillard probably would want that because what is he going to be left with if one of those guys go? Um, so in particular, you probably got those two guys. You got some draft picks, even maybe some guys they just drafted. That could be a potential route. Um, in Miami, obviously, we saw was close to getting to the championship. The other route and the other team, I think, would be really interesting, by the way, the Brooklyn Nets. And here's why. The Brooklyn Nets already have some solid wings when it comes to Dorian Finley Smith, when it comes to hopefully um um re signing um no. um no <laughs> Cam no. Johnson. When it comes to re signing Cam Johnson, they'll have some solid wings there. They'll have Dinwiddie, so that's not as much ball time pressure. Damian Lillard can play off the ball, you can play it with the ball. Um you have Claxton who was an up and coming um center in, in the middle that could play really good. And there's a lot of things to like about this Nets and obviously Mikel Bridges, of course. Um, so this team in general with him inserted would be an interesting conversation when it comes to them. Like I said, in the top of this conversation, playing the East allows you to have some more opportunities to get to a finals. There's more routes to get to a final than you are playing the West. Um, so that being said, I think those two teams in general make a lot of sense. People are talking Golden State. That would be an interesting situation. Um, because I obviously thought in the beginning of all this, what if that happened? Um, but there are a lot of – and that could easily happen, I would say. But also, it's not exactly as clear-cut. So I would say those two teams when it comes to Heat and the Nets, obviously a lot of people are talking about Heat. I think the Nets would be making a lot of sense when it comes to a compensation that Portland would like and also the fit that Damian Lillard would fit into that overall. And again, a, a route to him getting to the championship. Facts. All good stuff, man. I love it. I love it. Ben, then, then, uh, then well, actually, Gary, because since you were a little bit late, uh, I'll go to you, Gary, and then I'll go to you, Ben, to finish off. If that's okay, Ben. They we're talking about. Me. Uh, yeah, with, yeah, we're talking. Hey, yeah, we're talking. Hey, we're talking should, they, yeah. should they trade him? Go against yeah, his own wishes. Best. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, we're talking about your best friend, Gary Damian Lillard. Should he stay or should he go? Yeah, listen, I have nothing but love and respect for Damian Lillard and how much he has ridden for the city of Portland, good and bad, up and down. Bro, you got to get a champion. You got to get out. You got to get a championship. If you were meant to have a championship, you would have had one by now. Honestly, if, if Portland was meant to have, be an NBA champion, they, he's had stronger teams than what's currently, what he's currently dealing with. And he had a better – I'm sorry, I love Chunky Bill. He had a better coach than Terry Stotts. I'll say that. Like – he was, he was in a much better scenario when he was losing and being swept by Golden State towards the end of the of the 2010s or whatever. Like he was in, in a much better situation there. Saying that, I think we all know who um, we all know the teams. We know Miami is, is probably the like of all the teams that are out there. I think Miami is the likeliest place that he would end up at because I feel like Miami is more. Pat Riley is more apt to give up assets because he has never found an asset that he wasn't willing to trade, in my opinion. I think if it's a means of having this team be relevant and back towards the top again, especially in the East where seemingly that would be open up a little bit more for uh, when you consider Milwaukee and the unknown there, Philly and the unknown there. The Knicks are who they are. Cleveland is kind of who they are. Boston, Boston you don't, don't know. know. You know what I'm saying? Like, so 
of those teams, Miami is right for the picking to be that team that gets back to the top in the East and stay there. I think that would be the likely scenario. Brooklyn, again, you're like like you said, Nick, like you're banking on them re signing Cam Thomas or Cam Johnson and um uh what's it Bridges and all that. Like he they're, they're trying you're banking on that and I'm sorry, nothing against them, but I didn't think Brooklyn was that strong in their team post trade. They lucked into the playoffs because they front loaded so many of their wins at the start of the season. So, like, if you would have done that trade, if you would have gotten rid of Kyrie and Durant at the beginning of the season, then that's when they made the playoffs. Let's be clear about that. So, I don't. You know, I disagree. I think I don't think you watched enough games where Ky- Michael Bridges went the hell off. Um, he did. And I, 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 don't, I don't think he, I don't think you give him enough credit to Bridges. Um, with him and Dibwitty coming in and kind of bringing this team up into the playoffs, because even though the East is a is a, is a shit show, um, it says something about these guys coming in right away and taking a, a franchise that probably shouldn't even be in a, in a position that they were to get into a playoffs and to do something. I think it takes guys. No, I I, I, res- I respect Bridges. I respect Spencer Dinwiddie. I just am looking at. That team as a whole, I'm looking at that bench, I'm looking at their depth, and I'm like, that's not a sustainable. That if Dame Lillard wants to win a championship, that's not the offense. That's not the team to win a, to win with because I can't. I don't trust them. I don't trust them any more than I trust Portland to build a solid team, a solid bench beyond. You're saying Brooklyn is the same as Portland? I'm saying I don't trust management. I'm not saying that they're the same. I don't trust. Okay. I don't trust their management. To do, I, I think they're in the same boat. That like management is a little iffy as far as doing what they need to do for their star players. I look at that. I look at this in both cities. I'm like, it's kind of the same thing. So I don't think so, but I, I I think it's I can understand that your hesitation with management per se. But the only reason why they did that move as far as moving Irving is to make sure that they have something to build upon on instead of letting to keep it dying down. Because obviously Irving wasn't was you know. Like, obviously, KD wanted out, and then Irving was like, you know, these guys ain't trying to work with me, but it's like, you weren't trying to work with them. You were toxic as hell. So it's like, you can't exactly blame management. You can blame them for the Steve Nash hire. I'll blame him for that. There's a lot that you can look at the Nets management. Historically, yeah. they've never been the most well-run franchise, and I think Portland is starting to slide down into that, like, mismanagement Face. That's why. That's why I see. That's why I, I just I, think Portland playing in the West. You, it just you're playing in the West. There's true. so many teams in the West that are going to make it. And you, if you look from top to bottom, as you know, Portland is again like unfortunately on the shorter end of the stick of teams that aren't going to make the playoffs because there are so many other good core teams in the West. Um, if you put Portland East, yeah, they would have a puncher's chance to get into the playoffs. But it's like they play in the West, <laughs> so no, absolutely. It's <laughs> and you know, and to that point, I'm like, you know, how I look at Brooklyn, I'm going, how much further are you going to take Dame Lillard? I look at Philly, he can go further with them. I look at Miami, he can go further with them. You know, I, I'm looking at those trade scenarios and going, hmm, okay. If I'm Dame Lillard, those are the, those are your two cities. It's either Philly or Miami. Brooklyn is a good story. They can be something, but I'm sorry. If you weren't going to be a championship-level team with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, who, let's face it, like they've proven themselves to be at that level alongside of Dame Lillard, like, what's Dame Lillard going to do for you now? All I'm going to say is, just my, real quick. My last, that, point, my last point on that would be more of, if Dame become if if you ever hit, hit the Nets, I'm saying it would make sense for everybody around. But when it comes to Miami, I think Portland wouldn't get as much of a package in Miami than it would to them like Brooklyn. Brooklyn has more of the pieces; they have more things to kind of offer in a sense to give to Portland for that to have that more smoothly. And Dame, he said he he would, would be willing to play for the Nets, so that's something that's kind of there as well but with Miami I kind of I, I understand because they went to the championship they would have some more pieces it would someone make more sense but then besides Bam and Butler you have to ask yourself if they trade away some more of that depth like who else is going to step up in that overall team so, 
so and Ben, before I toss it to you, like here's what I'm just gonna say with the whole Nets thing is that Mikel Bridges went off, but there's not enough of a sample size to know whether his offensive game is sustainable enough to be a good number two on a championship team, right? Is the infrastructure there in place? Miami has proven that they could be successful by developing young talent by four, having four undrafted free agents. If they give it to some of those, they can plug and play with some of those guys. I trust what Spolscher is doing because he's been able to go to multiple finals, multiple conference finals with a very underwhelming team. So I think that you have a decent good three with Lillard, uh, Butler, and as well as a Bam on a bio, and then you can fill in the rest of the pieces. They still made it without Tyler Hero, right? So I'm not sure. He, even if he was included in a trade, I just trust the, the prowess and the scouting of Miami versus Brooklyn. But I still think, Nick, you make some very good points, and I think the coverage is good. But I'm just not sure if he's good enough to be a number two on a championship team, which is what Damon Lillard wants, right? So fair that's enough. all. Yeah, that's that's yeah, fair. That's it's definitely fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> but all good stuff. But Ben, let's get you in here because we still got to get to Porzingis. We got to get some NFL talk. But but I love yeah. but I love the sparring though. All good stuff, guys. So uh, I'll be quick. I think the Blazers should trade Dame. We, I don't need to speculate on teams. You guys did that for me. Um, I think it's pretty easy. Uh, one thing I want to say on Dame is it's easy for anyone to say if we were in his position, we'd want to win. So we wouldn't want to stay. But if you, unless you're in that exact position, all you're doing is speculating because you don't know what you would actually do until you're in that exact situation. So I don't feel that he deserves criticism necessarily for placing importance on loyalty rather than the championship. If that's what makes him happy, that's what makes him happy. So if he wants to stay loyal, I don't think he should get criticized for that just because the public and the media wants him to win. That's not what he wants. Exactly. He, then, then like he should do what he wants. Now, as far as the, the Blazers, I think they should trade him similar to it was a long time ago, but Ray Bork – was on the Boston Bruins. He was a great, great, great player. They weren't going to win. They traded him to the Avs, and he won, it. He won a Stanley Cup. I like it. And I think the Blazers should do the same thing. I think that they should be like, listen, Dame gave us everything. We tried. We tried to put pieces together. But let's be honest, since they traded McCollum, which, to be fair, the pairing of McCollum and Lillard wasn't getting over the top. So I understand why they did it, because I think they've reached their ceiling. But since then, it's been all downhill. And I think the Blazers can confidently say, listen, Dame, I know you want to stay, but we want to do you a favor. We want to help you. So I think as the organization, they should they should trade him. But let's keep it moving. Let's get to some yeah, more fun. No players. doubt, no doubt. This um and this and, and Dame is going to be very interested. And Nick, I really loved your passion with that man. I really did. That's what we had to have you on. I love the past. We definitely got to bring you back on, man. So you spit fast, bro. I love it. I love it. So <laughs> this Porzingis, this Porzingis to the Celtics one, Ben, definitely has me a little bit interesting. Um, this trade, uh, there were so many different things that could have happened. Malcolm Brogdon was in the trade at first, but then ended up being, oh man, being a Marcus Smart, which I thought was interesting. I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to throw some numbers here. So so since 2017, 2018, these are the numbers that present that the numbers of games that represent that he's played 48, 57, 43, 34, 17, and then 65 games, which is the first time since 2016, 2017, albeit average 23 and eight on 38.2% shooting from three. The question is, is he worth the risk of trading away a guy like Marcus Smart? Um, I think, I think Ben, um, when you consider the number of games that he has missed, over the last five seasons, yes, it's a risk, but you got to love the upside. Your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so I think it was worth the risk because, sure, Marcus Smart, um, you know, he's the, you know, the block room, the heart, the, you know, all of that. And my response actually to my wife today, which she mostly doesn't like sports, but she loves her Celtics, was if all of that is true, that Marcus Smart is – an amazing leader, and he was the glue, he was all that, but they still didn't win, then it, it that doesn't it doesn't make him untradeable. Just because he has all those intangibles, he they didn't get a championship, I'm not saying it's all his fault, 
But I'm saying is the organization probably looked at it as he is going to be 30. We know because of how much he hustles and how much he cares, he gets injured. When you get on the other side of 30, if you're already injury prone, you're going to get more injury prone, most likely. And they probably, like it or not, and this is a topic for another day, they're likely going to pay Tatum and Jalen Brown over $600 million, which, again, we don't want to go good idea, bad idea, not now at least. But you, you only have so much money. You can't pay everyone. So they probably looked at it as we got to, if we're going to get Porzingis, we got to trade something. So overall, to me, worth the risk. And to me, it does increase their chances to win a title just by a little bit. So. And, and Gary, I'm going to throw this in, but just real quick on the salary cap perspective. From the salary cap, right, he's owned $38.6 million, but he's on a short-term loan unless they want to pay him more money. So with that, it's going to hamstring them. And what has been the one thing that has allowed them to be successful is their depth. So they have to really figure out the numbers if they're going to pay Brown and they're going to pay C, uh, KP, how that's going to work out with the numbers. But that's all I was going to say. Gary and then Nick, take it away. If you would have told me that there would be a roster in 2023 that has Christoph Porzingis and Blake Griffin on it, and it'd be the Boston Celtics. I would have laughed at you. Yet here we are. Um, I'm a fan of Christoph Porzingis' game, although I do call him a better shooting Sean Bradley, and he hasn't proven me wrong thus far. Um, and to your point, Ben, like, you know, if Marcus Smart really is the heart and soul of that Celtics team, if he is the if he is to the Celtics what Draymond Green is to the Warriors, then this trade's a little a little dicey. I think it's a benefit for Memphis because now you have uh, leadership at that guard position while your would be leader is out. I think he will provide that same uh, Tony Allen type toughness to Memphis, and I think that will be a benefit in the long run in the long run but as far as what Porzingis can bring yeah that's another 20 point score and you know somebody that can shoot from deep can, uh be a threat if he can be consistent and can be healthy enough to last long enough then yes you know i think you look at a team like you know, look at a tatum jalen brown and you put in brogdon and you throw in a, a kp i think there's not a great there's not a fall off I don't, I, I don't think they're better for the trade at all, but I don't see them being like, oh, we're going to tail off and go from being a 50-win team to a 40-win team. I don't, I don't see that. I think they'll be where they're at, but I don't see this being a trade of any significant consequence to them other than Mark Smart being gone. Yeah. And Gary, does it make them a champion? Does it improve the chances uh, to win a championship? And then we'll throw it to Nick. No, like I said, they're – they're no more better than they were before the trade. Okay. Facts. I'll take that. Same. Mr. Mr. Wilcox, your thoughts? I mean, I think it was a great trade for the Celtics. I think literally people are kind of downgrading, like trying to really – Marcus Smart was a decent player for them. I felt he was always a more of an emotional leader for them, though. So, yes, you lose some perimeter defense, but you improve – Another person that can score in the inside could get a jump shot going, can hit a three every once in a while. Um, and the playoffs, you need a guy like Przingis. Um, You get to keep Robert Williams. It's not like you lost him. It's not like you, you stop Horford on the books. You could potentially probably trade him away for something else if needed. Same thing with Brogdon. So I think you can still get some depth with this Boston team. I don't think Boston's done yet making moves. And I think they're still in wh where they're at. I think they just got a little bit better, but obviously it's not like a huge plunge towards them being a finals contender, but they are still in that conversation heavily. Um, I think they improved their odds. It's just more of, it's not obviously like a boom play where it's like, it's almost a guarantee for them to go to the finals, but they keep themselves very relevant. And I think as long as Porzingis is healthy, that's what it kind of hinges on. I think it's a good bet. Um, Porzingis makes 33 million on this contract deal, which is hefty, but again, I think with a guy like Porzingis who can get you a 25 and 8 every once in a while with two blocks, that kind of makes up for Marcus Smart's two steals per game and his 15 points. Like, I think there's a great move for Boston and a step in the right direction for them to get back to a finals finals overall and winning a championship. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Ben, any final thoughts before we get to the CP3 trade? No, I was just going to see if I could uh, 
Yeah, so know? Chris Paul, um, top 10 point guard ever, probably top five. But let's stick with the now. Um, the now, this is the Warriors are going to be his fourth team in the last six years. That tells you a little something. Uh, his points per game has decreased in four out of the last five years. And I looked, it, the minutes played is basically the same. So it doesn't have to do with less minutes, more minutes. It, it's basically the same. So his points per game has decreased. His assists, I mean, passing, if you have passing as a skill, that doesn't go away. That's always going to be a skill no matter what, what age. So the assists hasn't really moved. But, um, you know, he's, he's obviously on the downside of his career. Um, I can understand to a certain extent why the Warriors did it uh, because of, you know, when Curry went to the bench, you know, how they were this year specifically. But let's just be real. This was we want Draymond and we don't want Poole. And we have to keep one of them. We can't keep both of them. Draymond has four rings. Yes, he's older, but we're going to choose Draymond, definitely paying him less compared to what they were paying Poole. So it was a trade in saying that we want to keep Draymond, and we are going to, and we got to get rid of Poole to do that. And you know what? Chris Paul might help us. You know, he still could be good, but I don't see the Warriors as better today than two weeks ago i just yeah i think it's it just like a eh, the, the same yeah. i mean they didn't improve yeah yeah nick you know like for me it's 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 clearly a salary dump because they made a mistake giving jordan Poole that that contract i'm just going to call it what it is um but for me from an exit and standpoint it just doesn't make sense you're looking at a 39 year old point guard um who wow you know, he's, he's not that old injured. I mean, old, 39 is not old in real he's life, but in basketball, he's not old. Man, 37. Hey, 39, man. I mean, that's correct. 30, just turned 38 in May. Just turned 38 in May. Oh, okay, well, happy birthday. Happy birthday. We'll send you a cake. We'll send you a cake. Um, <laughs> but I mean, like, look, okay, 39, 38, 39 is not old, but in basketball terms, let's just call a spade a spade, right? But yeah. it it just means they're older. Whole hell of a lot smaller. Um, that's all I'm going to say. But Nick, your thoughts can go to you, Gary. I honestly think, see, people are looking at this move as CP3 being the starter. Who says CP3 is even going to be the starter on this team? And if he isn't, which I think could be a benefit for Golden State, because they know the game changes when it comes to playoff time, half-court offense, and you don't have a solid leader coming off the bench. I think CP3 leading the team off the bench provides some opportunities to get more of a pick and roll going, provide things from a leadership standpoint to keep things in check, and allow CP3 to st still not play as many as minutes as he used to play in. And it provides Warriors a little bit more depth here. I think, although they got older, I think the Warriors still have an opportunity here to still compete at a very high level with CP3 being the sixth man. Um, I don't see him starting unless it's fourth quarter, which obviously I would probably want that. Um, but in terms of that goes, I think everyone's looking at this move a little bit like, oh, like he's going to be like starter-ish. Um, he, he really shouldn't be. He should be looked at as a sixth man. But who says he's even going to stay with the Warriors? Maybe the Warriors have another move. But I think that's where I'm seeing this move at the moment. It's like it looks a little bit like, oh, they got older, they got rid of pool. But, again, I think – Poole leading off the bench when he was uh, like coming off. There was still – Warriors had – I think they were bottom five with turnovers when he was on the court when it came to them coming off the bench. So in terms of turn not turning the ball more, they bring the assists, they get more of their game going off the bench. It makes sense from that point of view. Um, but like I said, I don't think the Warriors are done, and who knows if they'll keep on the CP3. But I, I don't look at him as even the starter in his offense um, overall. Yeah. No doubt, Gary. I think he's. I think CP3 is part of a bigger trade ship in the future. I don't know what it is, but I just I have a hard time seeing him on that team. They're working something else out, but that's just my thoughts. But what, what's your take, Gary? So when this trade happened, I, I looked at it as more. They're getting rid of Jordan Poole, 
than the Warriors taking on Chris Paul. I think, you know, clearly whatever happened when uh, Draymond uh, punched all the common sense out of Jordan Poole, it, it, it fractured the team and fractured them together. I think Steve Kerr definitely um, made that call, like, look, we have to get rid of him somehow. I don't know if Chris Paul was the one to do it for, but here we are. Um, to the next point, he's not going to be a starter. There's, there's no – Chris Paul accepting this trade, he has to understand, like, you're basically now the sixth man. Like, you're going to be the, the leader off the bat. And I think for the Warriors, does that make them a better team? Ooh, that's a, a heavy question to ask, honestly, because, you know, we, we talked about Chris Paul. I know, Ben, you said top five. I'd say probably closer to the top ten point guards of all time. Um, but we've all joked about I've spent the bulk of the last 92 pre- previous episodes talking about death taxes and the Chris Paul postseason injury. You know, like I, 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 it's come up many times and it did not fail me yet again this week. So if you're, the Warriors, if you're the Warriors, like, I get it, but – you're no more of a championship contender than you were this season. You might win a few more road games, which, God help me, you probably should have anyway. But as far as him being an impact player and being the reason why they get back to the championship level, no. And and just real quick, can I just, just give, like, some props to the Wizards for being able to get out of that horrendous, that horrendous contract with Bradley Beal? I think these, like – a $250 million contract with a no trade clause and his numbers are clearly going down. I mean, and then for them to get Jordan Poole and Tyus Jones as your front court, two guys under the age of 26, that's not bad. That's, that's not, that is not bad. And they're still not done. I just got to give them credit for that. Um, but Ben, any other final thoughts on that before we go to Shay O'Donnell? No, no, I'm good. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, um, let's kind of get to this because I really want to get to this football one here. I'm just going to be very brief. Latani, um, look, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the Andrews here and I'm looking at this, uh, I'm looking at this ownership group. They really have no idea what they're doing. Um, right now they're currently sitting at 43 and 37, five games back in the division. Um, they're a very, they're a team average at best of five and five in their last 10 games. They're actually in the top five in or top 10 rather batting average on base percentage and as well as in runs per game but in that 10 game suit but in that 10 game span they're in the bottom half of everyone so i think a cl- i think a drop is going to happen um if i'm them i trade them at trade deadline and try to recruit as many assets as humanly possible uh and i take for the highest bidder but gary your thoughts did make them then so yeah i was looking at i was looking at the records as well and while yes, they're third in their division, they're only a half game out of the last wild card spot. Right now, it's Baltimore, our Yankees, and the Blue Jays are occupying three wild card spots, and then it's Houston and the Angels that are a half game back. So it's a weird position because historically, you look at the Angels it's like for all the talent they ha- they've had, they've never been able to get it right. Like I don't know what it is. Like you have this. You've had you had two gener- you have two generational talents on your roster. You had one that was the face of baseball from the month of April to the month of September because October he was nowhere to be found. And then you go ahead and get another generational talent that's putting up Babe Ruth better than Babe Ruth type numbers, and you're in the same spot. Like I thought that the Donald Sterling Clippers were bad, but they ain't. <laughs> The Angels, might be, uh, the Angels might take the cake here and there's with less controversy. Probably not as racist. So, you know. Wow. <laughs> if you're asking the question, what should the Angels do? Unless you're what, getting ready to pack up and move to another city like, oh, I don't know, the A's are doing. Unless you're doing that, you hold yeah. on to it. <laughs> yeah. Unless you're in that boat, you hold on to it, Shohei. You, you know, like that. Him and Bam. 
Mike Trout are the faces of your franchise. And if you happen to have just decent management, general managers and presidents of baseball operations and all that, like if you have better people at the top, that Angels team should be a contender for championships year in and year out for the next five to ten years, especially with what's left of Mike Trout in his prom. But we know that they're not. So saying all of that, you trade him. He shouldn't go to the Yankees. He absolutely should not go to the Dodgers because, like, they need it. He needs to go someplace else that will really make an impact. I'm going to throw Atlanta out there because they got the taste of success in 2021, and they're still hungry. Like That team overachieved and realized, hey, we can actually win this if we get hot. You put him on Atlanta, forget about it. They'll win the NL East for a long time. Max? Okay. Yeah, I respect it. I don't want them coming to Yankees either. We need a lot more. We need no, a lot more than Tommy. A lot more than that. Hey, Nick. We're going to ruin him. We're going to ruin him if we, if we do. Nick, sign to an extension now. Trade or extension in the offseason. You're the GM. Sign him right now. Sign him right now. Shohatani is like the Babe Ruth of our era right now. Sign him to an extension right now. And I know people are going to say that the Angels should be trading him. He should be better on a different team. He'd do him a favor, get rid of him. You didn't do anything with Trout. You're going to waste Otani away too. Here's the thing. When you're uh, when you're not as big of a market as you are the Angels, it can be really tough in, in baseball if you don't have a high cap, if you're not the Yankees or Red Sox, the, Bra- the Dodgers. If you're not one of those teams that have higher caps, you ain't competing right away. So when you have a guy like Otani, you're going to do everything you can – Keep a guy like that because you're going to have your window at least open to at least going to a playoff and potentially a World Series. The window is going to stay open for you with a guy like that. Um, him and Trout in the same team, yeah, they need to figure out how the hell to win games right now to put it together so they can find some success for their overall organization. But if I'm in the yeah, if I'm in the manager chair, I'm not trading him whatsoever. I'm going to look to extend them as long as I can so, again, I can hold that window open so that way we could get some other guys in. You know, in baseball, you know, you can hit as many home runs and drive as many runs you can and stuff like that. But if your defense and your pitching is not up to par, it's not the snuff, when it comes to postseason playoffs, that's what it's all about to me. Yes, you want to get the runs, and that's obvious. But when it comes to playoff baseball, it's about pitching. It's about your defense. Um, so that's where, again, like, that's where it really comes into play. Um, I love Otani. I think he's doing amazing things as a pitcher and a hitter. Um, but I think for the Angels' sake, I think they need to hold on to him, extend him, so they can hold that window open. You know, Ben, if I recall, they in the in draft, I don't think you, I don't know if you do this, Nick, but I think it was two three years ago they used all their draft picks on pitching. Where the hell is it? That's all I'm going to say. They yeah. used all 15 of their draft picks on pitching. Where mm-hmm. the hell is it? I don't understand. I'm that's yeah. uh, here nor there. As I, I mean, say. Just, fi- just just fire the scouting guy, you know. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, come on. I mean, not not <laughs> one of them. Not one of them is on their starting rotation. Not one of them. But ben, that's crazy. So on Otani, I say, um, you know, it, it, Ryan, you kind of. You stole it. Uh, what I was going to say is they've had two of the best five players in Major League Baseball for now five and a half seasons. And out of those five and a half seasons, I'm including this year, they haven't played one playoff game. Forget won a playoff game. They haven't even played in one. They haven't made the playoffs with two of the best five players in baseball. And sure, Otani was hurt the majority of one of the seasons. But still, throw that out. That's still four full seasons of having two of the best five players not going to the playoffs. Like, that is absolutely absurd. And for me, from I, I lean towards paying him now, but at the same time, for me, we already know he's had some injuries. We already know that he <clears> – <throat> we already know that, you know, with that and being a pitcher and a hitter, that those injuries could – get worse as he gets older. And for me, his trade value is never higher than right now. Um, he's never, to me, he's never going to be as, well, I mean, sure, you could say the I got a question season. for you, Ben. But, what package would you be able to get for if you're the angel if you're really going to trade him? 
I'm you know not, you got all these teams lowballing, right? I, I'm like, not even. I'm not even. I didn't even think or, or, or go there. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm not answering that because mm. I personally, uh, personally, I, I lean towards extending them. But let's be honest, the Angels don't have fans, whether he's on the team or not on the team. So from that perspective, that wouldn't make me say no. Um, but Nick, see, I. For a player that is the modern Babe Ruth, Babe, modern day Babe Ruth, they go. would they would get a haul. I understand what I'm you're saying, saying low, low ball, but they would get a haul. And, and Gary, before we throw it to you, just just real quick, because that like to me, I'm thinking five, at least five top end prospects, three fielders, two pitchers, and cast consideration. I mean, you're the Angels, your team that's contending. He leads. He's he's top. He's top ten in hitting and pitching. You get two for one. Um, yeah, I would. It, I think it would have to be more than than the Juan Soto trade. That's what I'm saying. The more than the Juan Soto trade, easily. Way more than the Juan Soto trade. Easily. That's what I'm saying. Like six, seven draft picks. I'm talking. Right. Give, give me the keys to your. Give me the keys to your hundred million dollar house. Give me everything. I want it all. Give me yeah. your wife. I don't care. Um, anyway. I'm, Sorry, I said that. But anyway, oh, respectfully. <laughs> Gary, let's get to this NFL chatter here. Let's go to it. We're just going to do everyone just down the list here for the sake of time. Then we'll leave, you know, two or three minutes for conversation. NFL playoff picks, division winners, wild card teams. Gary, Ben, then Nick, then you'll finish it off. Go ahead, Gary. Okay, so NFC North, I got the Lions winning the, winning the division. Uh, the South, the Saints, I guess. <laughs> somebody's, gotta, somebody's gotta win it so okay, fine um so we'll say saints i have the eagles breaking the streak of uh nine consecutive division winners in the nfc east i think that they're they're loaded and they got better in the offseason so i'm gonna stick with them to win the east i got the 49ers winning the west because i don't trust arizona i don't trust seattle and i don't trust uh really anybody else and the rams so and then your wild card teams, I'm going Dallas, Minnesota, and uh, my New York football giants because I'm a homer. For the AFC, I'm going AFC North, I'm going Bengals, South, Jaguars, East, Bills, West, Chiefs, and then the wild card, Jets, Ravens, and here you go, Jeff, your Denver Broncos. But understand that I only picked well, them because we're on the show. To be very clear. Oh, really? That was, that was a good deal. <laughs> Got a lot of Got a butt here. Wow. Okay, come on. It could, it could, be, could be them. Excited. It could be the Browns. It could be the Dolphins. Who knows? But don't <laughs> hey, don't mess with my emotions like that, Gary. Come on now. Come on now. You trying to about to give me a diabetic heart attack on this show? All right. All right. All right. So Broncos. here we go. I'm gonna surprise y'all with the AFC because there's gonna be a team that you're gonna be like, wait, where are they? So division winners: Bills, Chiefs, Jaguars, Ravens. I do think the Bengals have probably the best roster, but at the same time, you know, Ravens, they got a squad. And obviously Odell injury, Lamar injury concerns, but I'm just going to say Ravens. Bengals aren't going to fall off the face of the earth. So Bills, Chiefs, Jaguars, Ravens, wild card, Bengals, Miami, Chargers. Sorry, Jets. I... I'm just saying, in in history of all sports, there are a lot of teams that the expectations are here, and they fall flat on their face. And <laughs> something just tells me, like, Aaron Rodgers, like, I'm sorry, like, he's better than Zach Wilson. Like, anybody would say that. <laughs> like, come on now. But I just think that they're not – I just – yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. I got the Jets missing the playoffs. People can call me crazy. I don't care. NFC, Gary, NFC East, I was very uh, close to picking the Eagles, but here's the only reason that I did it, to be honest. One, A.J. Brown, besides last year, has gotten hurt every single year. That's number one. Number two, Jalen Hurts with his style. There could be some injuries there, too. So, granted, if they're both healthy for 14 or 15 of the 17 games, I'm going to say they would win, but... Because I like what Dallas has done and because I think that 
getting rid of Kellen Moore was a good idea. Getting Brandon Cooks as your number two. I think their trio of wide receivers, Cooks, Lamb, and Gallup, really good receivers there. Um, and, and getting Stephon Gilmore, and it was 31, 32, but their second corner was their biggest weakness the entire year. So now that's not the case. Um, so Cowboys, 49ers, Falcons, Lions, and I got the wild card, Eagles, Giants, Seattle. There's my 14. Okay. I like it. I like it. Nick, your thoughts? Yeah, AFC for me, I'm going to go wild card first. Buffalo, Denver, Pittsburgh. Winners for the divisions. Bengals, Chargers, Jags, Jets. Now, for as much as you just said about the Jets not being a team that is going to make it the postseason, I just think they're – division winner and you have a lot of things that are going to go their way defensively like they're a unit that could have easily made the playoffs on that alone they had some solid quarterback play now you insert rogers Garrett wilson obviously a receiver that is going to go berserk this year just watch um and i think in general this team is a really solid nucleus in general um i'm not going to say they're going to be a super bowl contender but they're going to have an opportunity to at least win a lot of games um, and to, it's going to be a fight for that division, but ultimately, the hey, what were your three wild cards, AFC, one more time? Buffalo, Denver, Pittsburgh. Okay. Got it. I have the Ravens missing out, and it's only because I'm not sure about their defense. Um, I like Lamar, I like the offense. I'm just not sure about their defense in its entirety. I think Pittsburgh made a lot of additions from the draft and free agency. I'm not a believer in Pickett. But I just think Mike Tomlin could get these guys over the hump. Um, so I think that's why I got them slotted. I think Denver, I think they're you're in for some positive regression for them. If I think Russell Wilson will get his stuff together, I think Denver will be a better team in general. It was the offense that was holding them back, not the defense. So I really like the nucleus. I think Sean Payton is going to come in. They're going to have systems go working. I think they're going to have Russell Wilson got that Drew Brees late career magic going. <laughs> um I think Denver's a solid team to bounce back. And, um, yeah, the Jags are for real. You saw it last year, them go, coming back for 20 points down um, overall. So, I mean, in the wild card. And the Chargers, I mean, they're just a team that you get a guy like Kellen Moore becoming your offensive coordinator, and now you got a team that's going to go, I think, could easily score a ton of more points than they did offensively last year with more of the vertical offensive schemes that they'll have. Um, and you have more of a complete offense. The only problem with this team was last year is that the, could they stay healthy? And hopefully health is, you know, fitting for them this time around. The NFC, I got the Eagles repeating, yes, the first time division winner in the last 20-something years. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. I think, obviously, the Eagles have a great offensive line. Um, so anytime you have something like that as one of the top five offensive lines in the league, like, you're going to have an opportunity to win a lot of games. Defensively, you got these monsters from the draft. <laughs> Yeah, you might as well just call this team, um, you know, uh, Philadelphia Bulldogs because <laughs> they got so many Georgia Bulldog players for that team um, that continue to factor um, winning caliber prospects. So um, I think Philly would be the most complete team in that division. And, yeah, barring injury, they should take the division once again. Um, the Falcons, for me, is a team that is on the rise. I think people are really doubting Ritter. Um, I think you should look at some of this college tape back in Cincinnati and you should really double check that. Um, so that's where, again, like for me, that's, I think the team, the Falcons are more complete. And I think in a division where it's open up for the SEC South makes sense. The lions for me, simply based on, they will just build upon what happened last year for them. The Niners, because Kyle Shanahan runs a great team in general, they're going to stop the run. They're going to play some great defense. No matter who the quarterback is, you got to feel confident with CMC back there. And then the wild card, Seattle, Dallas, and the Giants. <laughs> so um, I think Brian Dable for the Giants, they're, they're, although they don't have a top receiver, um, I think they really have a good core going around. I think Brian Dable can bring this team to another level. Um, and same thing with Seattle. They had a great draft. So 
Yeah, and the cow good stuff. Cowgirls. <laughs> uh, nice. Gary, I know that you're about to face some technical difficulties, but go ahead with your gripe real quick, and I'll leave my teams out because y'all know where I'm at. It's either Broncos or Bryce. Uh, I don't have them winning anything this year. But anyway, you go ahead, Gary, and then we'll conclude. Um, I mean, I really don't have much of a gripe this week, except, you know, you brought up Ben, um, Chris Paul, Paul being a top five point guard. For the next episode, I would like to invite – anybody and everybody i personally think that he is outside the top five present five point no, guards. i agree with that so they present five point guards that are better than i can name five right now so you know I, but for me just going back to chris paul in general i don't want to sit here and continuously shit on his legacy because he has proven to be a winner wherever he goes except that as i've said before guys like him guys like james harden they're allergic to playing basketball in the spring so i'm asking the golden state warriors is this it have you already decided that your dynasty is going to die and you're going to now go ahead and place this jumping of the shark on chris paul because it seems like that's going to be the narrative with him and part of, or at least part of his legacy and that's unfair to him but you know, numbers don't lie. We, we, he hasn't gotten to the finals. He hasn't got – I mean, he got to one finals. Otherwise, it's been a good career, good to great career, but the way that we all sit here and call him the point god, relax. I can name five sure. guys better. Okay. All facts, all facts. But, guys, it's been a fun episode. Um, good stuff, Gary. Good stuff, Ben. Nick, do you want to give a, as for everyone on the show, do you want to tell people what you're doing, how they can follow you and, and all that good stuff? You got the floor, sir. Yeah, awesome. So um, TBQ Sports, we do a live podcast every Wednesday, 830 Eastern. Come check us out. Come and be a guest host. Love to have either any of you guys on. Um, I got my own thing on YouTube, Big Mouth Fancy Sports. Going to be talking a lot about fancy football. Got more, more videos to come out soon and to drop. Um, so it's going to be a fantastic um, next couple months because it's about to be the holy grail time of the year where we got football, basketball, hockey, like all all in the same and the baseball playoffs. Like you got it all. So look out. I'd love to be on here again and I appreciate you guys for you know the love and support and all the comments and the chats and um I really appreciate it all. So look forward to being on again soon. Well, no doubt. Definitely like to have you on, Gary, Ben, until next week. Um, we're getting close to episode 100, guys. It's going to happen soon. We will get there, hopefully before football season. Um, well, that's all for tonight, folks. Uh, <laughs> I think you're well on your way. I like, you know, I like adding with a little humor at the end. I like right? that. We're getting hopefully there. Hopefully get we there. Will. Yes, we will. Go, team, well, go. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but until next time, <clears throat> That's a wrap for tonight. We want to thank all our supporters. Stay tuned for our next episode sometime in the near future. Maybe we'll have an episode this week. Maybe we won't, but we'll definitely have one next Tuesday. So peace and love, y'all. Deuces.